So I'm Lois Stonley interviewing Professor Christine Griffin on the 25th of February of 2022 um, over Zoom. And we're discussing their life and career in the context of feminism um, and its history within psychology as well. Um, so first of all, then, um, could you just tell me a little bit about yourself? So maybe along the lines of kind of the uh, trajectory of your career and the topics of your work? Yeah, so um, I'd be the first um, member of my family to go to university. Um, I came from uh, Lanc Lancaster uh, in the northwest um, of England and I started off doing um, a psychology degree at Aston University in the early 1970s. Um, and I didn't really know what psychology was at the time. There were no psychology A-levels. Um, mm. But I, um, I'd seen um, an old girl at a, the school I went to who didn't, was doing a PhD in psychology. And I just thought, oh, I, that looks, sounds interesting, but still without really knowing what it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. And... Um, I'd got a place at the University of Birmingham, which is a very traditional experimental positivist mm. department run by a professor Broadhurst who did research with rats. And uh, luckily I messed up my A-levels, so I didn't get in, but I did get a place at the University of Aston's very new human psychology degree. And it was unusual because it was human, just human behavior not animals as well which at the time was unusual mm. only 10 students quite young staff quite a social psychology focus I had no idea about this at the time um, yeah. but it really suited me and then after I'd finished the degree um, I thought I might do a PhD this was the mid-1970s and in those days, it was much easier to get a grant. Um, I was interviewed at Birmingham University by uh, Mick Billig as a potential supervisor. Um, and I knew he'd done research uh, with Henri Tajvel about social identity, experimental research. Um, and I wanted to look at women's gender identity, but I didn't really know how. Uh, there weren't really theories. There certainly weren't feminist theories in psychology. Um, all the research that had been carried out was um, mainly with young men, college students or sixth formers in uh, Tarshvel and Billig's case. Um, and there was some, I, some sort of, some work about gender roles, um, uh, sex roles, gender stereotypes. But that was, I was interested in identity. So I started this PhD without really much of an idea what I was going to do. And nor did Mick, to be fair. Um, but we got on like a house on fire um, and, you know, had similar interests. Mm -hmm. But I ended up, in those days, it sort of wasn't possible to use qualitative methods in a psychology PhD. Mick was doing interviews for the book that became fascists about um, uh, members of the National Front. So he was using interviews, but the idea of a PhD student doing it was just didn't uh, figure. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the research about gender was about sex differences with biological explanations. Search for differences, any differences must be biological. Yeah. Um, so I ended up doing a load of experiments that I wasn't really interested in and a very open-ended questionnaire at the end, um, just asking young women students what uh, gender meant to them. But I didn't have any way of making sense of it. Um, and it was before Jenny Williams and Howard Giles wrote a paper that came out in 78 and Glynis Breakwell in 78 as well, which was sort of thinking about how you could apply Tajville's social identity theory to, to gender and women's um, experiences, but that hadn't happened. So um, I nearly left academia in disgust, really. I was going to be a yoga teacher. 
Um, wow. and, and um partly over the dissatisfaction with methods um but also in relation to how to understand a gender mm. um and sort of by chance the job in um, cultural studies came up which is a research fellowship for three years looking at young working class women leaving school and entering the job market it had been funded by um, the Social Science Research Council, which became the Economic and Social Research Council later. And it was set up um, by um, a woman called Halla Belloff, uh, who was at Edinburgh University, she's, she's dead now. Um, and it was set up to put a social psychologist into an interdisciplinary department. So it was a job for a social psychologist Mm -hmm. doing a, a project in cultural studies which I didn't know a great deal about yeah so Halla I think Halla I don't know if Halla Belloff was on the interview panel but Mick Billig certainly was Stuart Hall Paul Willis um, were on the interview panel and I got the job um, and joined a completely different department. You could not get more different than the department I'd done my PhD in, where Mick Billig, who of course is now, you know, internationally known as a social psychologist, was completely looked down on by the very authoritarian head of department, um, who, when I first joined to do my PhD, Broadhurst summoned me to his office and, um, asked me how I was going to manage. I was, I was, I was married, at, I just got married. I got married very young. And he said, how was I going to marry, manage doing housework as well and looking after my husband as well as doing a PhD? So that tells you all you need to know about <laughs> his approach. Um, yes, interesting. Very authoritarian, top-down approach to, you know, a very narrow view of psychology in mm. Birmingham psychology department as it still is actually um, and um, cultural studies the center was you know informed by marxist and feminist um, anti-racist work um, it was run as a collective as far as possible um, it was truly interdisciplinary really transdisciplinary although cultural studies now has become a sort of media studies based um, discipline in its own right then it was really just everybody working on common projects um, with, and the focus was the project not what disciplinary background you came from although it did make a difference um, and it, it, the focus was on um, popular cultural practices and their significance um, so to me, as a social psychologist, because I was interested in um, young women and small groups, this was a way of um, making sense, maybe. And began, I began to get um, exposure to, to feminist ideas. Um, and then I, um, and I did the, the project on uh, young women and work, it was called, and it was published as a book called Typical Girls in 1985, although I was on the dole, unemployed for a year when I wrote it. Um, uh, and then, <laughs> so that was quite uh, difficult, um, but returned eventually to psychology. I got a, a two year research post at the Center for Mass Communication at Leicester University um, in the early eighties to look at um, black youth unemployment, but it was a very, a questionnaire based study and quite traditional. Um, and then I got a lecturing job at Birmingham University, which had been Mick Billig's old job because he moved to Loughborough. Uh, so I worked there from 1985 to 2003. But by that time, I'd, I'd got a network of people um, that you know, were doing similar youth based research. Yeah. Um, in psychology and out of psychology um, and you know sociology and so on and I then um, 
I suppose I knew Sue Wilkinson and Sue Condor um, because yeah. Mick supervised her PhD um, and she'd done a PhD about gender and feminism and qu using qualitative methods. And Sue was a real pivotal person, Sue Wilkinson, and she asked me to, to contribute, you know, book chapters and talks at symposium at um, psychology conferences or social psychology conferences about qualitative methods. And then her book, Feminist Social Psychology, I did a chapter on. So I started to get back into um, psychology mm. and bring back the ideas that I'd um, come across and the work I'd done in cultural studies to psychology and you know all sorts of developments had happened in the meantime I guess yeah um, and I'd got an ongoing interest since really on, on young women's lives and how they negotiate femininity and and gender but always but also in relation to sexuality and race and class and always set in a wider discursive an ideological and cultural context. So I was never looking at identity as a, um, a sort of a thing uh, you are or you aren't, but what it means, something that's negotiated. So I'd always be looking at cultures, I suppose, um, yeah. drinking cultures, free parties, um, in music festivals, what they mean to young people, young men and young women. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you for yeah, um, yeah talking through that. Um, I suppose I was just going to ask and kind of follow up then. So, um, you know, do you feel like you, I suppose, going from the, the PhD, um, which was a bit kind of uncertain, as you said, in terms of the methods yes. um, into that cultural studies, did you feel like you kind of learned a lot through um, through that and kind of how did that, inf that influenced your work? Yeah. Yes, I mean, hugely, because, you know, I was chairing an office. I mean, cultural studies, although it was at the time in the early 80s, was producing, um, you know, books that were influential all over the world, really, um, like The Empire Strikes Back, um, which was the race and politics group, Women Take Issue, um, the Women's Studies group, and so on, policing the crisis and things. Um, um, it was it's really small it's like a half uh, um, half a, cor a corridor on a tower block 60s it, hideous 60s tower block <laughs> at Birmingham University so it was really small and we used to get visitors from all over Europe and America and Australia Bob Connell came before um, she became Raywin um, masculinity researcher and they would say oh is this it um, so I was crammed in an office with Angela McRobbie and Paul Willis and others, Trisha McCabe, uh, you know, it's very sort of everybody in together. Mm. And there were all these um, reading groups where we, like on work or leisure or education, where we took a topic and you could either join or not, and you'd take a topic, read around it and discuss it. So we were discussing things all the time. Um, and if you were in a particular group that was writing up a book and working on a, a bigger focus project, then the group closed and you concentrated on that. Um, so I'd, I wasn't in any of those groups that were working on books because they'd started before I joined. But I mean, I just learned a huge amount about methodology from people like Paul, who's a really good ethnographer, because mm. he was doing work actually he'd finished the work for learning to labor which was in schools but he he was doing work um in longbridge a big birmingham car factory since deceased um mm -hmm. so he was talking about what was happening um in his research and also angela mcrobbie and a load of others uh, about feminist um right. theories there were huge arguments about um the challenges that feminism um, and uh, anti-racist work posed for Marxist approaches, mm. sort of race and class, uh, race and class and gender and sexuality and how to think all of that together. So they're very heated, <laughs> very heated discussions. 
and of course a huge political changes because Margaret Thatcher's um, Tory government had just come in in 1979 and I started the project in January 79 and she kept, that came in, in in the summer so huge um, changes get massive increase in youth unemployment very suddenly um, 20 different ways of calculating uh, youth unemployment by the government all of which lowered the figures you know all sorts was going yeah. on yeah de- um, yeah so that kind of historical and political context really influenced yes, learning yes. in that sense yes it did yes so it was um, I learned a lot about methodology as yeah. well as uh, the feminist uh, different feminist ideas yeah how interesting yeah lovely yeah. um and so um yeah you spoke about kind of then getting a network of people I suppose and getting yeah. to know those people how how was that and how important was that for you then within your your kind of work and your um career well I think it was essential once I'd moved to the lectureship at Birmingham University or left cultural studies really because from from then on I was working in a place where nobody really was sim- sympathetic to my work didn't understand it didn't respect it so I was just tolerated so I you know I taught a course a final year optional course on um, gender and social psychology I think it was called for years at Birmingham which was popular with the students mm. and it was really about feminist well it was about social psychology and then feminist theories and um debates but you know I was just accepted as you know do it but I never was um really see I don't think I would be seen as a real psychologist because I was using qualitative methods Mm. um mainly and also and the gender stuff I think was just ignored so I depended entirely on um networks of of sort of people who were doing similar work to me and some of them were in psychology and a a lot were not they're in you know sociology anthropology youth research all sorts and later on sort of business studies when I got involved in research on consumer uh, consumption and identity Right. So I've been you. I've never gone to uh, psychology conferences in a, a even women in psychology conferences consistently because the work I was doing was all over the place. Really. Yeah. So that kind of interdisciplinary um, yes. setting, I suppose, really important throughout. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. OK, so. Um, yeah, so. I suppose when you first kind of were thinking about going in in the direction of psychology, then you touched a bit on that already. But what what exactly kind of attracted you to to that kind of work? Um, I think um, I think that I was interested in um, identity and in small groups, not individuals, because psychology. Um, as a discipline, how, uh, particularly well now and then, has such a focus on you know the mind, the brain, the individual, um, and I was interested in small groups of pe- people and how they um, interact together. And you know, Tarshfell's um, theoretically his ideas about social identity in an early paper he, he did in, I guess, 1972, I think, which was um, theoretical, not, not um, empirical, really, mm-hmm. um, I thought was really interesting. So what do you do if you are in what he called a minority group, which, of course, means a, a subordinate, subordinated group, and women are one of those, and so are many other groups. Mm-hmm. What do you do psychologically with that if you're getting messages that you are somehow inferior or deviant or deficient um, and how do you make sense of that how do you negotiate the world in which you live as an individual but also collectively I suppose what cultural studies gave me was an idea of a, a more collective culture but it's sort of what everyday social interactions mean to people 
in the context, in the historical context and political context, and how we negotiate our, our worlds, ourselves, and produce ourselves and transform ourselves in, in the world. So it was that that I was interested in, but I didn't really find um, the, the theories or the methods in psychology then, mm. really, or they were just beginning. And um, so I would read more um, diff all sorts of different feminist work. Um, yeah, so I think that was... Yeah, yeah. So uh, did your kind of feminism kind of come around at that, at that time then, whilst you were kind of exploring that? Or do you think you had kind yeah. of those thoughts before you know starting on the psychology yes I think it actually started when I was a teenager um mm. because um you know I was uh, born in the early 50s so I was born in the shadow of World War II and I was really interested in in this thing that had happened interesting we're talking on the day you know all sorts of stuff is happening in Ukraine um um how people behave when things and and you know continue in their lives with things like that happen and of course i read about the holocaust and then i so i would read uh, like autobiographical accounts of of ordinary people who've been through these tumultuous events and then um when i was a teenager i got heavily into music and i made popular music um yeah and particularly soul music, which of course was so linked to what was going on in the States, the USA. My dad, for some reason, brought home Time and Newsweek magazine. So I read these voraciously and there were all sorts of um, uprisings going on, civil rights movement, black power movement. Um, and it was linked with what was happening in the music world. So I was interested originally in the anti-racist anti-Vietnam War movements in the States, but I wouldn't have been in any political groups. I was just reading about it. Mm. Um, and then my, my um, and in Ireland, of course, I lived in Birmingham in 1971. There was the pub bombing um, by the IRA, which you yeah. know, killed a lot um, and injured 200 people. And I, you know, I was nearly in one of those pubs. It's very near the university. So I followed the the politics in Ireland too and so I think I just was used to, to that's what I was interested in mm -hmm. and then um, that sort of popular culture and activism and uh, trying to understand politics and so um, and I don't think I thought much about my position as a woman apart from a sense of objecting to the way I was always you know first of all a focus of as a young woman a focus of the male gaze which I wouldn't have seen it like that then <laughs> and also dismissed and ignored um, at the same time so when I started I think I was in a consciousness raising group before I joined cultural studies when I was doing my PhD but when I joined cultural studies I came across just a lot more yeah. activism that I hadn't, you know, had any contact with. So I got involved in, um, I think we, um, we squatted a house because there was no refuge for what called battered women in those days. So it was like the early beginnings of women's aid um, in the UK. So we, we squatted a building to use as a refuge and things like wow. that. So, um, amazing. yeah, so, uh, so I would have been involved in Birmingham's like radical feminist group, um, which is still the feminists everybody else really dislikes. But but to me, they were the only ones who were theorizing sexuality and and challenging um, the way rape was dealt with and sexual harassment and assault in ways that make set made sense for the experiences of the girls and the young women I was um, working with in the typical girls project who were who were seen as a sexual being so um, yeah. that's why I got interested in that really and then later 
in the early 80s, I worked with Trisha McCabe. Um, we ran a girls group in a youth club in Birmingham for quite a few years because girls didn't go to youth clubs and all the full time work youth workers in the whole of Birmingham were male mm -hmm. um, in the early 80s. So it was like single sex work uh, with girls was a way of um, building, you know, doing something that girls were interested in. So, yes, yeah, so I got into it through that, I think. Well, that's so interesting. So that kind of activism yeah. side of things was yeah. started quite early, I suppose. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Hmm. And yes, and an interest. Yes, an interest in it. And then when I came across, you know, things that I could get involved in, I did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so that kind of was developing almost at the same time as you were getting in um, to the cultural studies and, yes, and all that yes. stuff. Yes, so. yeah, I think so. I mean, there was nothing like that in any other academic department. And yeah. the Centre yeah. Cultural Studies had a, you know, an ethos of being uh, politically engaged and did a lot of work in local schools and things. Yeah, that's really interesting because psychology wasn't as as much kind no. of seen as political um, or able oh, to be God. political. No, well, quite the opposite because the BPS um, had a, a edict of you know being apolitical, um, yeah. and I didn't join. I mean, I very belatedly joined the BPS just before I retired. I can't remember why. Um, <laughs> Um, but all the way I was, you know, I ran a, B, a BPS Women in Psychology Conference in 1991 and I wasn't a member. Um, okay. I had no time for it at all, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, because of that, because of this, you know, we're apolitical, we shouldn't be political. So I just thought that was completely misguided, yeah. particularly because, you know, the BPS newsletter had published a piece on race and intelligence by a guy called Rushton, who was basically, I mean, Mick Billig did a lot of critiques of the, um, the sort of racist work of psychologists at that yeah. time. So, you know, one point they were saying we're apolitical, but then they published things like that. And there was a big debate about whether they should have published it and, um, and anti-apartheid boycotts of South Africa and things like that. So there were a lot of debates that Steve Reicher would have been involved in heavily. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, so one one foot in, one foot out of it, really. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, switching gears then a little bit. Um, you know, I suppose you've mentioned kind of... Um, yeah, your PhD supervisor and those kind of networks. Yeah. But did you have any other kind of key mentors on your journey or, or any even now? Um, or anything yes, like yes. No, I was, it was interesting that uh, a question about mentors because um, I think um, when I started out, the things I wanted to do, um, I, I couldn't have put into words <laughs> what I wanted to do. There wasn't... Um, a way of thinking about it in psychology, really. And in a way, um, I think I wrote in a, um, there was a sort of editorial of, of feminism and psychology, the journal, um, not that long ago. Um, I don't know if it was 30 years on from when it was launched or whatever it was, uh, that we had to, it took us two years of planning the journal and normal journals, you know, it's like six months and you know you off you go mm. but we had all these editorial meetings for ages and it's like we had to imagine the space in, in order to, to to create the the possibility of doing the work and I think when I started off I was like no clue yeah. um but I came across just some people who gave me hints that this was a possibility so I think Halla Belloff actually who um, was, you know, based in Edinburgh for years. And she had, a, um, you know, she did do an interest in, you know, women's identities and so on. But and a lot of her work was on art and all sorts of things. But she had that um, openness 
um, to uh, not just doing psychology, uh, you know, narrow experimental positivist um, approach to the mind and understanding how the mind works, but actually to see people's lives in context. Um, yeah. And my PhD was examined by um, Marie Yehoda, who is, was a real force. I mean, her, the history of her work with Paul Lazarsfeld and Marie and Thal on um, the psychological consequences of long-term unemployment. In the 30s, you know, she was an activist psychologist um, and, you know, fled the Nazis and all sorts of things. Um, actually... Uh, she did say in my PhD viva, um, you know, what relevance do you think this has for, you know, people living in Hansworth and, you know, poor areas of Birmingham? And I said, well, none, you know. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, she, uh, she was amazing, but, but sort of older and like a different generation. Um, so I think Haller... Um, was sort of closer to, you know, I could see that he was a, a woman operating in psychology and doing, you know, what different things, not what I wanted to do, but different. And Mick Billig, um, you know, he, he forged a path of, of doing what he wanted to do and looked beyond um, psychology as a discipline. I mean, he read and was always read historical you know, looked at the history, and I've always looked at the history of, um, you know, gender or youth or whatever. So, um, you know, the book Representations of Youth is partly looking at the history of the concept of adolescence. And it was things like Mick. Um, and yeah, he, he would understand that you'd find out as much about how race and racism work from reading James Baldwin as you would, in fact, you'd find out more from reading James Baldwin than psychology research. So he, right. um, you know, and he, he had, he just would say, well, experimental research is all very well, but you're not going to find out anything that really matters. Um, mm. So he was, um, he was supportive in that way, just um, in cr thinking critically, but independently, but not, you know, a, a, a blank spot when it came to gender, really. Um, right. So I think in terms of, of gender, I don't think I had mentors, but I think I had collaborators. Mm. So it was more um, uh, people like uh, Sue Wilkinson, um, uh, Susie Skevington, who was in Bristol and then Bath, and Tricia McCabe. Um, so... Uh, and Helen Haste, I think that Susie Skevington and Helen Haste were previous generations of feminists who were in psychology, right. both at math, where I ended up, interestingly. So I think they were, um, but they weren't direct mentors or collaborators, but they were sort of role models who were out there, I think. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so I don't think I had like an obvious a mentor because the, the, what I wanted, there wasn't anybody doing what I wanted to do. Um, mm -hmm. So it was just occasional uh, people, um, I suppose. Stuart Hall, you know, just whose work was, was interesting. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. So um, kind of, yeah, people who you worked with or kind of saw from afar maybe a bit more than... Um, Yes, answering directly. Yes, and if you think of the history of feminism in the well, the twentieth century, last century, you know there'd been a lot of activism around uh, women's suffrage and related issues that in that then faded, and then there was a resurgence, so-called second wave in the nineteen sixties. Mm -hmm. So um, it's almost like there there weren't mentors there somehow it's quite yeah strange well um, yeah something to do with the way psychology has gone and academia has gone and there were very few women in academia actually you know when I was at Birmingham even when I was a lecturer 
um, it's a big university. There were like six women professors Ooh. and that's minuscule. So yeah. it was run. It was just, and uh, yeah, when I was doing my, uh, when I was a admissions tutor, this would be in the nineties. Um, myself and Ross Bradbury, another lecturer, we we're in the science faculty. So went to a science faculty admissions tutors meeting with the only women there. Um, and the man who was you know, chairing it said, oh, ladies, lady admissions tutors. This was the 90s. So, you know, it was um, yeah. really different. You, I forget actually how horrendous it was. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely things have changed, haven't they, over time, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yes. So, yeah, I, I mean, you yourself have kind of forged a path in that sense. So have you kind of taken any key role in mentoring yourself? And has that been? Well, I suppose I have in relation, uh, both, in, I think, individually would be in relation to PhD students. Mm. Um so people like Martin Holt, who's in Australia now, Andrew Bengry Howell, um, who I've worked with quite a lot, um, and and quite a lot of different um, PhD students. Linda Bailey's more recent on young people, young women and drinking, um, and I think sometimes PhDs I've examined, and that's a sort of one to one thing or researchers I've worked with. Um, Sarah Willett is another one. Um, so there's quite a few PhD students. Um, but I think there's also um, like a, a, a more collective uh, mentoring of, um, say, when we launched Feminism and Psychology, in a way that I see that as a mentoring role, because we were opening up a space for um, women and men to you know to to do this work and get treated seriously and you know respected um and also the um because i organized a women and psychology conference at birmingham in 1991 and i see that as a mentoring thing although i don't think it worked actually was <laughs> was um because i've been to quite a few um feminist conferences um which wouldn't count as academic conferences that were just, um, there was a women's WRRC, Women's Research and Resources Center, which was, um, uh, and then there was um, Trouble and Strife, which was a radical feminist magazine. I think they had a conference, there were feminist research conferences. This would be in the eighties. Mm. So I'd been to those and they were a combination of academic papers, sort of theory papers uh empirical papers people's phds or projects they were doing and sort of activist workshops all together um yeah. and so i tried to bring some of that to a women and psychology conference that was academic and had papers and workshops um and you know worked with others as well and phoenix i think um Mm. would be a really important collaborator actually um so yes and so yeah i've worked with her a, a lot um and kumkum uh, bavnani as well so yes yeah, so so we did the conference um and for, so for example i invited um a dr mera o'shea who's who worked um she was a psychiatrist in Dublin and she'd been supporting the Birmingham Six who were wrong, you know, did 25 yeah. years in jail for being fitted up for the Birmingham pub bombings. Um, yeah. And she had been doing something on the psychological impacts of strip searching. Um, so I invited her to, you know, to do a workshop and things like that. Um, and so it's things like that I would see as um, mentoring. Yeah. Um, and when I say it didn't work, what I mean was a, a few years down the line after that, and there was another women in psychology conference that was much more traditionally academic. And of course, I understand the pressures on, you know, particularly now even more, um, you know, having to fill all the, you know, jump all the um, fences and 
so on to you know do academic work in a, a acceptable way yeah. um, so that so that sort of more activist open edge was lost but I think that was a change from the 80s into the 90s anyway that that was happening across the board yeah that's interesting you, you felt like that activism side of things was really important when you were um, kind of starting that yes and um and it it sort of has been pushed to the side and separated there's more of a a, a gap between um a sort of activism and or uh, activism and academia than than there was and also it's been turned into um all this stuff about um i can't even remember the jargon now um like knowledge transfer and all that sort of stuff um and impact that's it yeah impact. yeah impact. so it's been turned so so things that were about activism have been uh, for, become all this stuff about impact case studies which is not quite the same thing um yeah so it's a, a, a different object. so we used to you know we used to have debates about power relations in research and suddenly that became all about research ethics which yeah. of course overlaps but it's not the same and some things are lost in those debates yeah that's really interesting um yeah almost like a simplification of those concepts yes. i guess yeah yeah yes yeah yeah okay um brilliant um yeah so obviously you've mentioned that you're a founding member of um, feminism and psychology um did you want to tell say anything more about that and kind of what that process of setting that up was like and and whether that's kind of influenced your perspective of uh, on um feminism and psychology and and how that's developed at all yes i mean i i think because um the journal was first published in 1991 but we the you know the the group the core um, editorial group um uh which also did include Anne Phoenix and, and Kumkum Bhavnani's a, a, a bit later, I think, but certainly they were involved too. And, um, um, but we met for two years at the offices of SAGE in London yeah. um, to work out, you know, what we wanted it to look like and the processes. Um, and it was like a, a very long um process really um and yes it was like we had to imagine it into being first and of course once it had come out um it was you know it was like well yeah this is great um but you soon forget um i think we were trying to to make sure that there was a sense of collective um that you know that it wasn't uh, just like any other academic journal um, yeah really um yeah so uh yes and i think other you know other people have written in the journal about the history of it as well yeah, yeah sure um yeah so were you all kind of part of a of the network before you um started mm. that or did you i yes i suppose i knew um, I can't remember actually, but I certainly knew Sue, uh, yeah. Sue Wilkinson, Sue Condor, Jenny Williams, because she'd written about gender. Um, and Jan Burns, I knew less well. Um, she was involved as well, but she was more clinical psychology. So I, but I'd come across all of them before at probably mainly social psychology um, conferences like bps social section conferences sometimes there was a there was a london bps conference in december that i think i might have come across um some of them and also in the second half of the 80s sue wilkinson had had um um symposium on qualitative methods in social section conference i think so i think i've met i've met people there i think so we we already knew each other and there were probably weren't all that many of us actually thinking about it 
um <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, but we knew there were, you know, people all over the world as well doing a similar work. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, okay, well, um, changing a little bit again then, a bit, but bit more about kind of, um, obviously, as you were saying, you've done a lot of work um, around kind of young people's constructions of, of themselves and, and drinking culture yes. and stuff like that. Yes. Um, do you want to tell me a little bit more about that, those kind of projects? Yeah, so I think the thing that I became interested in um, sort of after I moved from Birmingham to Bath, um, which was 2003, um, when I moved to Bath, and this was a department that had been set up by Susie Skevington and Helen Haste, and also Richard Vellerman, who's an alcohol researcher, and um, David Gooding, um, who did did work on science and communication so it was a small department um mm. but it it was and isn't anymore tragically um one of the few places in the country along with I, Loughborough would be another and um University of uh, East London I suppose would be you know there are other departments yeah the way you could do critical and qualitative and feminist work and it would be valued um as opposed to um not allowed at all or just tolerated mm -hmm. so um after I moved there that was when I started to get my work was respected so and I also had got um an ESRC grant with Anne Phoenix I think before I left Birmingham about young people and consumption and identity and so then I wanted to do something about um drinking young people and drinking because at the time uh, in the 1990s and into the 2000s um, there was a heavy sort of culture of intoxication going on which was partly to do with how the booze industry was yes. um, uh, marketing um, sort of alco pops really to, to young people and also there were gender changes in, in um, who was drinking and um, how uh, how they were drinking yeah. um, so I was interested uh, because when I'd been doing the typical girls research the young women I was working with um, were not expected to get drunk I mean sometimes they did get drunk but when they went out you know they were not expected to get drunk like the boys it was unfeminine mm. and by the 1990s onwards this culture of intoxication and a different way of marketing booze, um, young women were expected to get drunk alongside young men, but it was also still seen as unfeminine. So I was in, I thought, well, this is one way of trying to understand how they deal with that. Um, um, and also it, it seemed to me it was something to do with the you know, the post-feminist moment and period of um, very sharp contradictions yes. in relation to femininity. Um, so, you know, it's this impossible dilemma of how to manage these contradictory messages and imperatives. So that's why I got interested. And that, of course, there were debates on in post-feminism going on um, with people like uh, Ros Gill, for example, and um, Valerie Walkerdine actually is a really important um, because she was doing, I'm thinking back, she was doing work on girls and maths when I was doing a typical girls. So there were people like Valerie, very much more in, in, informed by psychoanalytic ideas than me. Um, and Helen Lucy, who I worked with at Bath. So there were others. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I got interested in it from that perspective really mm. um, and I'd always been interested in young people and young women's lives because they are trying to negotiate um, you know sometimes quite contradictory and difficult pressures as they're growing up absolutely yeah and those changes um, yes uh, yeah, yeah uh, quite kind mm. of clear in their lives yeah okay um, that's really interesting. And then I suppose 
in line with that more recently and um, that's been involving some more work around kind of social media and um, yes. digital yeah. kind of research yes. so yes. how has that been and, and kind of have you faced any issues with that kind of research Yes, I mean, I was interested in that because I was interested in um, the ways in which um, young women and men were represented and represented themselves. I mean, a lot of um, posts and, and marketing related to drinking. Um, so, um, and also the ways in which online... Um, you know we are the product we're being we're the thing that's being sold our our data uh, yeah. you know is the is the product um and so i was but i again i found the the work that was most interesting there was um um people who'd been influenced by cultural studies ideas so media studies um so I've worked with Jeff Gavin, who's at um, the Bath University still, but also um, Ian uh, Godwin, Godwin, Godwin um, who's in New Zealand now, who is in cultural studies. Um, so um, again, it's sort of overlap. Jeff's a psychologist and Ian's more cultural studies, but it's like the, it's the meeting point where it's not the discipline that's important, it's what questions you're engaging with and trying to make sense of what what work you're doing what the, not quite what the issue is but um you know that was the interesting um thing really and then what methods can you use really mm. um, to try and understand what's going on yeah absolutely because I suppose kind of using or doing kind of online research is still fairly new in that sense yes that kind of, yes yes still it emerging. Is. And very, very difficult. I mean, I don't think I ever really got my head around how to, to do the work or write it up yeah. um, because of the complexities um, of it. So in a way, I sort of retired. And, you know, and also, sadly, there was a PhD student, uh, Paul Wheat, and a, a, a really good um, researcher, Gemma Lennox, both of whom I was working with on projects related to um, young people's drinking cultures and uh, social media marketing and and they both had sort of for personal reasons had to finish before they completed their work so I sort of retired early in a way because I, I could see that the, you know the work wasn't going to come to yeah. fruition really. so I think the, the publications never really came out of that as much as they might have done yeah that makes sense yeah Okay. Um, well, I suppose before we kind of move on to talking a bit about, a bit about POWs in kind of more depth, yes. I wanted yes. to ask whether there was any kind of one accomplishment or, or piece of work that you were most kind of proud of that maybe you yes. wanted to touch on. Yes. Um, yes, I was just trying to think about that. Um, I, I think feminism, I think the collaboration of, of you know, and the launch of the journal, uh, feminism and psychology was really important um, and um, and I think uh, and also the conference the women and psychology conference in 1991 although it's a massive massive amount of work I never organize a conference again um, <laughs> but it was it was really different um, and uh, I think that was important and I think um, typical girls writing it up because Paul because it was set up as a parallel to Paul Willis's learning to labor right so he had three years to do research about young working class men in schools and then he got another three years to do research about following those young men into the job market right. um I'd got three years to do both the school side and the work Mar the job market side but for young women so to be you know only focusing on young women was obviously a, a radical an unusual thing to do it was seen as unusual mm. and in the context of all this research or not just in psychology in education as well which was just boys um and young men and co male college students 
Um, so it was unusual to focus on girls. And I got that instantly from people I was interviewing in schools, like the teachers and um, the girls. But actually, um, the teachers um, were like, well, why, you know, why just girls? And sometimes it was positive, And I've written about this. Um, for, for one head teacher, like, I think what you're doing is absolutely brilliant. Girls need encouragement. And and a, a male head teacher in another school was, well, I think what you're doing is a waste of time. All this equal opportunities, a waste of time. Most of our girls are going to end up as prostitutes like their mothers. So, you know, I knew that, <laughs> that something was, I was touching a raw nerve by, mm -hmm. by doing it. But Paul had written in order to try and grapple with the, the difference between the, the young men, the lads' lives and really complex Marxist theory, he had the book Learning to Labour in two parts, and one was the ethnography and the other was this Marxist theory about cultural penetrations and so on. And I wanted to make the whole of the book, Typical Girls, like more integrated and not go into the complex abstract theory because that's the other thing that was going on in cultural studies was some fights <laughs> between um, a, a dominant idea of abstract Marxist theory which is really hard to understand mm. and the ethnographers who were more of sociologists who, who were actually um, had to battle to, to make their voices heard a bit. So I, I wanted to try and make it a you know academic book that my friends could read who were not academics. Um, so I, I think that's a, something I've always tried to do to avoid that really complex language. So I think that's yeah. another thing. Yeah, that's definitely important. I agree with you. And just quickly then, kind of how how did it feel, I suppose, for you to almost come up against that wall that you're kind of talking about, about your work being unusual and maybe not accepted as much? You know, was that something that kind of put you off? Or... No, it showed me thing. It was something to try and understand. It was like, oh, OK. So um, so I un so I in a way it was I could. Um, I expected to get that uh, a response of some kind that was not entirely positive from, you know, some uh, male take teachers, male academics, um, and a more sympathetic understanding from some of the women I interviewed or uh, women academics. It didn't always split like that, but that I expected that. Um, but the thing that I think was most surprising was um, virulent opposition from some Marxist men over, um, it took very little to sometimes, I mean, trigger them, you, you would say now. So um, Dorothy Hobson, um, who did research on um, popular um, TV, women's consumption of, you know, popular TV soaps, uh, we were doing um, a talk at a conference on sport and leisure, which would be a sociology, the Leisure Studies Association or Leisure Studies um, uh, aspect of, of a section of the um, British Sociological Association. So we, we were doing a sort of small conference in London and we were talking about women and leisure. So Dorothy was talking. Um, so this was what we did in the early eighties in cultural studies. Dorothy was talking about women's leisure and I was talking about young women being a part of leisure for men. They were like objects for men to consume during their leisure time. But I was all just talking about, you know, young women's um, leisure, really. Mm. So we were talking about women um, and a, a Marxist guy in the audience leapt to his feet and said, well, define the relationship between patriarchy and capitalism, which is not what we were talking about. Right. And I said, well, no, that's not what 
we're talking about. But that was like the hot potato at the time. Right. This terrible tussle between, you know, what is the meaning of patriarchy and how does it relate to Marx's theory of capital? Um, and I said, well, that's not what we're talking about. And he said, well, you know, better than a Nazi. And, you know, like really a, a fascist and this and the other. Um, and actually John Clark, who was, who was there, but, you know, was, was supportive and the other ones who'd organized the conference were supportive, but it was in, even in left groups, mm. there was this real touchiness about um, having, a, you know, and the, the single sex girls work was like so touchy to be having a space that was just women. Yeah. Um, and I, and so, so there used to be a national association of boys clubs and a national association of girls clubs, youth clubs. The national association of boys clubs is still with us. The national association of girls clubs at some point in the fifties, I think, or sixties became the national association of youth clubs. Mm -hmm. So the girls club, so the, the female only space went. And so I see those pressures on single sex space for girls and women still around mm. today. Um, yes. So they're in a very different guise. But um, so I think it's it's that it's like, OK, this is telling me something. And it, I immediately I started writing about it um, yeah. in methodology book chapters as this is telling me something about the work I'm doing in the project. It might be something you would think it's irrelevant because it's not, you know, the data, but yeah. it's just as informative, those reactions of people. Yeah. Can I tell you about yeah, I, the discourse and the ideology and the culture around the issue. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, that's really interesting. Right, so we'll move on to, to POWs then. Um, mm. So, uh, yeah, I suppose, do you want to tell me a bit about your involvement with, uh, with POWs? Yes, I mean, there were also, of course, I'd forgotten a lot of it. <laughs> there were all sorts of meetings about, there was a women in psychology group um, in the UK, and I know Jan Burns was really involved in that, so I'd come across her through that. Um, and there was also linked debates about whether to um, try and push the BPS to have a women's section. Mm. So, so there are a lot of debates of whether it was even worth doing. Um, and of course, you know, some were, and Jane Usher was very involved as well. So, um, so there were a group of women who were like, right, let's, and Sue Wilkinson was like, and Celia Kinsinger, right, let's, you know, get them to... Um, have a women's section which is an important you know thing to do I don't think yeah. I was bothered about it myself but I could see the the value of it um so I was in I think I was involved in those early meetings about whether to do this and how to do it and um and I was never in the BPS or or bothered about it but you know I supported the the idea but I thought it was important to have conferences yeah and you know for some source of support um and so on um yeah so I think it was things like that early on um, yeah so um yeah because that so that was whips wasn't it in the beginning and then I yes said, um, yeah yes yeah so women in psychology that's it yes yes, yes. yeah yes. um and so yeah and so because I know you gave kind of a, a keynote at last year's POWs conference. Yes, yes. Um, which yes. is very interesting, by the way. <laughs> yes, I was so sorry not to be able to go to the actual conference. It's just yes. not the same. <laughs> no, it. it's not, is it? Uh, no, but anyway, that's how it panned out. Yes, it was yeah. really interesting. Yeah, mm. so um, that, that was really great. And so you've been kind of involved in that way as well. Um, and are there any other kind of feminist organisations that that you're a part of? Or? Um, yes, I don't. I don't really know. I'm just trying to think. Um, I don't think I'm involved in other uh, feminist organisations, particularly. I think I, I came from cultural studies. I sort of re-engaged with psychology 
in mm. a way, although I go to conferences all over the place, but I wouldn't be in other organisations, I don't think. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, have you seen in your own experience then, have you kind of seen um, powers develop over the years? Um, at all and yes I suppose I, well I haven't regularly gone to PALS conferences so um so I've come across like the a newsletter or um things published here and there so I don't know that I'm uh, really know how it's developed in a way because after I did the, the 91 conference and then went to a couple of um later powers conferences um, and they were more traditionally academic and in a way to me more narrowly psychological and less theoretical so I'd come across all this you know theoretical work to do with structural post-structuralism um, and discourse and it wasn't there very much in yeah. powers conferences and then the other thing I think that happened was um, discursive psychology started to grow and um, it really um, became like this is the way to do qualitative research in uh, psychology right. um, and so there were a lot of and and the problem with that for me was that discursive psychologists sometimes were not keen on um, more ethnographic approaches or interview based approaches where researchers engage with the people they're working with um, because of their view of it's you know it's like um, the data are produced by the context and therefore not as useful um, and I've written about um, you know, dis I wrote a, a piece called, um, oh God, I can't remember what it was called, In Discourse and Society, mm. um, where I engaged with the discursive psychology sort of dead social scientist stuff. I mean, it's in my CV and I can't remember what it's called. Um, this happened when I was doing the interview with <laughs> cultural studies as well. Um, um, being there or being dead that's what it's called right so I was arguing for the importance of being there as well as the discursive psychology approach so so just so so that then happened I guess sometime in the 90s is a, a particular approach discursive psychology approach just sort of this is took over us a, a bit and the, the space for doing the sort of work I was doing wasn't there, the sort of, in psychology. Uh, so the sort of um, debates about post-feminism and um, identity and the ways of doing research, which are closer to sociology, I suppose. Um, yeah. Although I don't think they were there in sociology, I was very pissed off with psychology. Sociology have got a so the BSA conferences. Um, yeah. They've got this worship of big theoretical guys, right. usually from different European countries. Latour, or it, there's always one of them, and it's just like, no, I'm sorry, yeah, I can't be bothered with it. Um, so, <laughs> so I tend to be more at home with like youth research. Um, because they're more they're more interesting. They're less less trapped by disciplinary constraints and debates. Um, yeah. So I've sort of I think I stopped going to disciplinary conferences a years ago, and then I started going because I was doing research on, on um, alcohol drinking. I started going to conferences that are just about young people drinking or public health and they're really interesting because they are such a stroppy bunch you know they they take on um uh, epidemiologists and all this they take on the global tobacco industry they have death threats you know like, oh talk about activists um so you know i just was more interested in those um and i've found disciplinary based 
conferences, which would have been better for my career to keep on going to, yes. I don't know, the BPS London conference till I died. Um, just boring. Mm. Um, so, um, but then again, I, you know, I got a job and I could do, you know, roughly what I wanted to do. I think if you're in an earlier stage in your career, it's more, it is difficult to do yeah. that. So I suppose more more of those kind of on the ground um, a- activist based things that were most interesting. Yes, or not even. Act- I don't know that they were activist based. It's more they were based on a, a an issue, a, a narrower yeah. issue, but it was an issue that people were looking at widely. So people from all over the world, um, and you know, and people who are doing academic work and not academic work. So yeah, I think it was that not, not just a, a disciplinary based like sociology, anthropology, psychology. Yeah, um, I think it was that it was uh, freeing. Yeah, and so do you feel like any of those WIPs conferences or POWs conferences um, were kind of a, a, a space for that as well, or did you find those a bit a bit? Yes. Different? I think the early um, WIPs and women and psychology conferences, because the the focus, and this was so new to have this space, Mm. um, uh, you know, just to go to a conference and not be sexually harassed. um, It's a big deal. Um, (laughs) And, uh, um, yeah, so I think it was... um, uh, the focus was the issue around you know women in psychology how to being women in psychology mm. how to understand it um uh the the research we were doing qualitative methods and you know how to do the, that work and then i think there was a shift toward gradually towards it being uh, powers being more of a disciplinary thing and like this is what you do if you're you know, uh, doing a, a PhD in women and psychology sort of thing. So yeah. to me, they became a bit uh, narrower and, and very few people were doing the work I was doing. Yeah. So there was less like, I mean, if I'd have been doing a, you know, a different topic, it might have been different. Yeah. yeah, I see what you mean. So uh, I suppose in that sense, then a bit more abstractly, do you think how's um how do you think powers might develop in future and do you think that it should kind of maybe develop a, a, along a, a particular path and that's quite a yes, large question yes yes I, yes I don't know I mean I don't know because I'm not so engaged with it in the mm. way that I was um so I don't know that it's for me to say in some ways um and I'm uh yeah I mean I the the things I would always say is, um, you know, look beyond the discipline. Um, yeah. So uh, Mick Billig always used to talk about his uh, CLR James, who was a um, Caribbean um, writer, wrote a lot about politics, but also was a cricket mad. And Mick was cricket mad. Still, <laughs> right. Yeah, still is. Um, and he wrote a great book called Beyond the Boundary, which is absolutely fantastic. And I don't know anything about cricket, but it was a great book um, about really the history of politics and race and cricket. Um, and he, he's, um, CLR James always said, what do they know of cricket who only cricket know? And Mick would, you know, what do they know of psychology that only psychology know? So... Yeah. You know, don't be too constrained by the disciplinary boundaries because psychology is a deathly business. It's mainstream psychology is horrendous and is showing no signs of improving in a major way. Um, Because, you know, Bath University had a great psychology department that was really, you know, small and not ticking all the boxes in terms of the ref and whatever but it has turned into really narrowly experimental um and yeah a a horrible place to work right um, for for me and 
um, for some of the others who are not qualitative researchers. You know, so it's uh, psychology, academic psychology can have a very dead hand in terms of um, limiting how you think um, and how you work and how you teach, I think. So, yeah. you know, don't, don't let it um, rot your brain. Mm. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah that's interesting so yeah kind of not enough of that criticality in that mainstream yes stuff. yes just read beyond whatever the topic is you're interested in mm. read the his read history uh read sociology read you know read biology read around and look yeah. for where the interesting work on that topic is going on yeah. because it probably won't be in psychology but if you engage with the people who are doing the work you're interested in, the critical work you're interested in, um, you'll get somewhere. Mm. You know, and it might be going on in psychology. You don't, you know, but yeah. you know, don't feel constrained, I think. But the, how you do that and manage to have an academic career nowadays, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the two things, yeah. So it's difficult. Clash a little bit, yeah. Yeah um yeah okay so um just ending off on kind of some feminism and psychology stuff um then what impact do you think kind of feminists have made in psychology so far um yeah yeah i thought that was a really interesting question i mean i think compared to be honest compared when i started off it was so narrow in terms of who the participants were in projects, the sorts of arguments you could make, the sort of methods you can use could use, um, that that has changed. So, um, you know, just having, a, you know, developing a theory based on, you know, Bristol schoolboys or American college students isn't enough. And the only explanation for, you know, the rapid search for sex differences, although it still goes on, Mm. It's not the only game in town um, anymore um, because, you know, notions of sex roles and gender stereotypes and um, even power relations around gender um, and sexuality and race and class are still are have come into psychology. Um, so I think that's. There have been, you know, and there it is possible to, to do, you know, to use feminist, feminist ideas in teaching and research um, in ways that it, it wouldn't have been before. Um, so I think that's, you know, things have changed a lot. But on the other side, I think psychology as a whole has really tried to ignore a lot of um, the sort of feminist arguments about methods or um, theory um unfortunately <laughs> and yeah. carry on with before yeah so it's almost as though as you're saying kind of the mainstream is is continuing mm. on and there have been some yes some, yeah some yes. changing but yeah 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 yeah, so do you think there's anything else, um, any key things you think that kind of feminist psychology should be aiming to, to accomplish in psychology um, or kind of yeah. to change? Yes, um, well, I, I would always be, um, I've never been a one for, for trying to sort of change psychology, really. What I always wanted to do was, you know, be able to do the work I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And that as many others uh, with others um, to have the space to do it, because I think if you turn to, to um, focus entirely on trying to, you know, engage with the, the dominant paradigm, it, that will soon exhaust you, really. Um, it doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Um, because just by doing the work you want to do, you are making a difference. But if you make your, your main focus, right, I'm gonna, you know, take on, you know, the, the boys or whatever. Um, I think that that is a really tough um, 
task. So um, I think I think nowadays is to, for feminism and psychology is is to 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 keep going and keep building um, the space and spaces um, around the world um, and to make you know connections um, and you know think critically and independently really. I think it's, it's to keep going and um, being a supportive and expanding and developing understandings and making links outside of academia as well. Yeah, I think that's really, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that last kind of five minutes has been uh, very advisory towards kind of um, young feminist psychologists yes. now, but did you have any other kind of key advice that you might give people entering? Um, Psychology. I uh, yes, I don't. Um, I don't think. I think I've said um, yes. I'd say make feminism your base, not psychology. Mm. Um, um, and yes, stick to or find what you want to work on, and why, um, and find collaborators. And if you need to sort of make a space to do that you know do it um yeah yeah so I, I think that that's that's the main thing I think the difficulty is um doing the work you want to do in a, a context that's you know not that is damaging it's you know contemporary academia is pretty toxic in terms of your health and <laughs> well-being so Yes, it's sort of surviving, I think. Mm. Um, survival is resistance and thinking critically is resistance as well. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, some really useful advice that I will yes. take on myself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I think that's it in terms of my question. So is there anything else that kind of we haven't covered that you'd like to touch um, on? I don't think so. Um, no, I don't think so. I think we've uh, sort of covered covered everything. I can't. I mean, I think a, an issue that I think is really a tough one to engage with is debates about uh, gender and identity now, which are uh, in relation to the um, what does a gender identity mean and what do women only spaces mean and. Uh, in relation to issues around trans and which have terribly become very, very fraught. Um, so I don't, you know, they have, those sorts of debates happen everywhere, but they certainly are debates for feminists in psychology, but yeah, but just a tough set of issues. And also um, I think the, the uh, what's called intersectionality now is like the gender, race, class, um, age and disability, how, those um, power sets of power relations work together and one of the problems for psychologists I think is that we have because of this way of thinking about you know gender as if it was nothing to do with class or race and so on and splitting everything up um, I'd uh, so I would I'd say that's a, a challenge um, yeah. There was some, one other thing. Oh yes, which uh, which I said in the um, uh, past, uh, keynote, which is I've I've been using um, uh, Stuart Hall and uh, Tony Jefferson's. Um, what they did a, an editorial to a book called Resistance Through Rituals, which was a youth research, very influential youth research book that came out in seventy eight. And they did in 2006, they did a sort of 30 years on editorial. And they talk about doing a symptomatic reading. In other words, what is happening here when you're doing research? You know, what's happening here? Um, what's it almost a symptom of? What's it reflecting in society as a whole? Um, um, and which, of course, it, for psychologists, it's very easy to miss that and just look, oh, look at these individuals without seeing them in yeah. context. And then what they call the conjunctural analysis, which is 
Why is it happening now at this conjuncture, at this moment? So what's going on, which makes you think historically, so the, which makes you think politically, more socially, culturally and historically. And I think good psychologists do that. Yeah. Whatever yeah. area of psychology they're in, they could be called neuro, <laughs> you know, but it, that's what psychologists need to do. And that's what psychology as a discipline tries to stop you doing. Yeah. But if you do it, you know, if, you know, it'll work out <laughs> somehow. Yeah, definitely. I think that's so important. Um, yeah, I see exactly what you mean there. That is really yeah. interesting. Yeah. OK. Um, lovely well i mean thank you so much for uh, for that chat that was that was really great um just to finish off just for the record could you state your uh, gender please oh female uh, yeah. and place and date of birth oh i was born in lancaster in um 21st of december 1953 Ooh. and current occupation well i'm retired so i retired in 2017 and stopped academic work really. So I thought, no, I've done my bit. Lovely. <laughs> yes. What's interesting that I started off um, squatting um, an old building in Birmingham. This would be 1980, 1980, um, that uh, was going to be demolished to make a private hospital. Oh. American owned private hospital. AMI is the name of the. I mean, the group is all over this country now, just busy yes. taking over the NHS. Um, huh. So, yeah, so we just went in and squat, squatted the building and moved in some uh, women and children. Um, I mean, I wasn't in women, Birmingham Women's Aid, but I just supported them by going and buying shopping and, and yeah. sort of cleaning up and stuff. And in the end, um, you know, the council did fund, Birmingham City Council did fund um, refuges, um, mm. but it was before that had happened. So, um, so it would have been radical feminists who did that. And same with rape crisis, the same sort of group. Yeah, um, I think that's so amazing. That. Yeah, so it's interesting that just that link. Yeah, I suppose yeah. that was quite kind of a scary, um, experience as well surely to kind of squat in it in a building well, I think I I don't think I wasn't there when they did the initial breaking in I think mm. Trisha McKay probably was um so that probably was but it was just it was just empty it was just empty oh, and right. nothing was happening yeah um and the police did turn up uh, yeah so the police turned up to try and remove us and I think I remember talking to them outside and this sort of older a police sergeant saying well ladies now who's your leader <laughs> and, and because because we were all women they, it sort of undermined their possible you know brush in and throw us all out yes um, yeah and I can't remember what happened in the end whether there was eviction uh, or not or maybe the council stepped in and provided a property I think that's what happened in the end um, so interesting yeah. yes 